I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. First, a general point about meditations. There are, of course, many, many kinds of meditations, including in different traditions and cultures around the world, including, uh, importantly, the practices of the first people, the native indigenous people around the world that have their own deep, deep traditions of contemplative practice. There are many kinds. Some meditations involve doing as little as possible inside your own mind besides sustaining an inclusive present moment awareness. Fantastic. Choiceless awareness meditations. Great stuff. Deepen in that myself these days. Okay. There's also a place for meditations in which we make a little deliberate effort inside the mind, including seeking to rest our mind increasingly on one object of awareness or another as a way to cultivate that quality within ourselves. So resting your mind on the sensations of breathing in your chest as a whole deepens your capacity to rest in the present, uh, not into the future or the past, with a sense of yourself as a whole, because that's what wholeness tends to support. Similarly, resting your attention on the feeling of being caring or cared about strengthens those psychological muscles inside yourself. The last one is for many particularly challenging because we haven't been cared about enough or we've been cared about by the wrong people or in the wrong ways. Understandably, that said, as enormously social mammals, primates, it's very important for us to feel authentically and healthily cared about in a variety of ways, whether it's a simple, mild experience of being included or something more intense related to being really appreciated or liked or even cherished and loved. These are in really important supplies to be able to take into ourselves, to gradually hardwire them, literally, into the fabric of our nervous system. Very important to be able to rest in a lovingness that's flowing out and flowing in. There may be limitations on the caring you're able to receive from others, but there's no limitation in principle on the caring, the compassion, the kindness, the respect for, you know, for others, a response to injustice, a lovingness. There's no limitation on what can flow out of you. So. And then as neurologically, we rest in this heartfeltness in and out, it helps us become more peaceful, more settled in our being. We, we feel nourished more by love as it flows out and flows in. And as we settle in that peacefulness, our minds can get quieter, present moment awareness can become more stable. And then we have a chance to, to rest in a, in a calm and open heart with a spaciousness, a wideness, boundlessness of awareness in all directions. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to take your stand there. And as you do that, by the way, you can it helps you over time to become more able to rest in choiceless awareness because you've internalized a lot of nutrients and food for the hungry heart helps relieve restlessness in the heart, helps us stabilize in open, choiceless presence to have done the cultivation practices that we did tonight in this meditation with the three kinds of breaths. So I'd like to continue in the exploration of how to live together and you can know that in terms of our timing, our schedule will go until 30 minutes past the hour, uh, which is 30 minutes past 7 p.m. in California where I am. 
And then after a brief break of a couple minutes of maybe waving at each other as we say as we say goodbye, uh, those who would like to be sorted into small breakout rooms in Zoom of four to five people should stick around. Please stick around uh, past the formal end. If you'd like to be in one of those breakout rooms, entirely optional. If you're in one of those rooms, please, of course, focus on your own practice. Make sure everyone has roughly equal time to talk and avoid criticizing, advising, instructing, or selling <laughs> other people. Uh, and if you'd prefer to leave, it's fine. When we come to that formal end, just push the red leave button at the bottom of your Zoom window, and then you won't get sorted into one of those breakout rooms. All right. Um, so I'm getting a request that I speak up. I've got the mic pretty close to me, and I'm speaking in a pretty conversational tone. Those of you in the Zoom windows, can you hear me okay? Is it okay? Okay. Um, I'll do the best I can with that. I know my voice tends to get soft, especially in a meditation. And if I'm loud for you, feel free to turn down your volume where you are. Okay, great. So I'll keep going. Um, so quick review. Last talk focused on trust. Trust is a huge issue in clinical psychology and child development, developmental psychology. Trust is a huge issue in, in relationships, isn't it? Because if our relationship is bigger than the actual basis for real trust, which is centered in reliability, um, that's a problem. On the other hand, if our relationship is smaller than the potential field of trust, hmm, maybe that's a missed opportunity. Trust, whether it's explicit or implicit, is a major theme in early Buddhism, um, including trust in oneself, and definitely developed as Buddhism flowered and flourished and spread through Tibet and China, Japan, and into the West, um, trusting in your own inherent basic goodness, trusting in the ultimate ground of everything. These are major themes of trust as well. So trust, trust, mistrust, and as I talked about last week, deep trust in what is truly reliable in an impermanent, you know, changing world. So that's what we talked about last time. And this time what I'd like to do is to um, foreground these topics again in a pointed kind of way and then open it up for discussion about how do we find healthy trust and frankly, how do we find healthy mistrust uh, around the boundaries or edges of what's actually untrustworthy, unreliable in other people. And how can we make the adjustment skillfully to rest in the perimeter or the space of healthy trust marked by healthy mistrust uh, on the other side of that? And by mistrust, I don't mean a kind of hostile, grumpy, you know, paranoia. I mean a discerning clarity of, oh, the ice is thin over there. I can't really trust it to walk on it. Or maybe I can trust it to walk carefully, but for sure I'm not going to bring any heavy <laughs> objects with me or start doing a tap dance on it. You know, that's, that's what I mean by healthy mistrust, discernment, clarity about where the ground is really shaky or maybe there's actually no ground at all. And then deep trust, which I'll get to in a minute here. So I hope to explore this with you. It's really, really, really powerful territory in our relationships, including trusting ourselves. Because so often what seems like mistrust of the world boils down to not trusting ourselves to deal with the inherent instability or challenges in the world. The world doesn't have to be perfect for us to regard aspects of it as trustworthy enough if we really trust ourselves to be able to manage you know, difficult conditions in a resilient and um, underneath it all happy kind of way. So trusting yourself and becoming accurate. Most people in my experience do not trust themselves enough. A few people trust themselves too much and they get grandiose and into trouble. I think it's said that 87% of teenagers believe they'll become a rock star or a professional athlete when they grow up. They trust themselves to do that. Well, I think that's great. Have a plan B, just in case, right? Um, 
Okay, so these are previews here. And um, so I wanna flag so far basic topics, right? In your own personal life, were there serious breakdowns in trust? In your caregivers, your older siblings maybe, your peers, your people who had more power over you, like coaches, teachers, parents, religious figures, uh, big, aggressive, other kids in school, you know, how'd that turn out? And what did what expectations did you form about how trustworthy the world is? And today, might there be opportunities in carefully risking one step more trustingness in the world or in others grounded in a trust of yourself? Big question number one. Me, you know, I, I grew up um, for all kinds of reasons, not very trusting of the possibilities of intimacy and depth of relating with other people. And I didn't trust myself to not be overwhelmed by my feelings. I didn't trust myself to be able to assert myself effectively. So therefore I lived in a very small way, moving into adulthood and early adulthood. And it's really been a process for me to learn who I can actually trust and trust more to have, you know, a reasonable, healthy give and take, not necessarily always perfect, but pretty good give and take with others. And to learn I can trust myself increasingly to take chances, reasonable chances, uh, moving into the deeper end of the pool of depth with other people and uh, trust myself to be more okay there, including trusting myself to be discerning that rut row, this person can't talk about this stuff effectively. This person's not willing to repair. That person just gets too flooded when it's too real. So actually we're able to maintain a relationship if we keep things superficial. Interesting, right? Um, so next question related to that is, are there people in situations where really it's time to realize that that dog will not hunt, you know? That um, ice is always gonna be thin. It will not support you. And to deal with the grief around that maybe, really recognizing, wow, with this sibling, we'll never get beyond a superficial Christmas card once a year relationship. And it's sad, and maybe that's the best we can do. Or to realize that in a company you're in, you're never gonna get promoted. Not in this decade, it just the ceiling is there for whatever reason, uh, including injustice. You know, is there something to see there or something to see in an important relationship, maybe an intimate uh, lover kind of relationship that, you know, it's, it's gonna be good, it's never gonna be great. And then in midlife, you face a tough choice sometimes. Do you stay with good rather than nothing at all, maybe? could be likely, or do you take a chance and you say, you know, good is crowding out the possibility of great. I'm gonna walk away from good and I'm gonna be really determined over the next year to find great. Maybe you're in a healthcare system. The truth is it's not horrible, but it's kind of mediocre. It's not excellent. And you really can't trust them to figure out what to do with your uh, chronic illness of one kind or another. And it's really time to look for a second opinion or to reach out in other ways for other resources and allies. You know, I've, I've known people, I worked with schools and families in schools a long time, and there would be, you know, families that clearly their child was having a problem in a particular school district, maybe a social issue with other kids and maybe a learning issue was, that was never really addressed, or maybe that child was gifted in some ways even alongside a temperament that maybe was a little challenging sometimes for others, bouncy, active, spirited, um, very creative, feisty even. And um, you know, parents would kind of keep thinking, well, it's gonna get better, it's gonna get better. But at some point, the trust in the future in that particular school district, uh, that particular setting, you just realize, no, we really need to take a fresh look here, whatever that might be whether it's to augment what that child's getting in that school district, 
maybe it's looking for other school districts, other schooling and situations, but you realize, you know, I've been naive. I've been trusting that something good would happen here and it's just not going to. Think about that. And if you like, you can share your observations in the chat. You know, in the chat, focus on your own experience. It's, it's cool to be supportive of others, you know, enthusiastic to appreciate what they're saying. Maybe offer some com you know, camaraderie with them from your heart while avoiding uh, advising, criticizing, lecturing, um, or persuading. All right, great. And then after these first two questions, so just a quick recap, based on your history, is the sphere of trustingness too small, maybe in certain particular situations or opportunities, often related to too small a trust in yourself that doesn't need to be so small. Maybe if you look at yourself, you realize, you know, I could actually trust myself more and thus push back the you know, bars of my invisible cage and do experiments in this life in which I'm trusting others more or trusting opportunities more? That's the first question. Second question is, is the sphere of your trust too big with some people or some organizations or situations? You're, and it would actually serve you to be more mistrusting in the kind of neutral discerning, not aggro sense I mean it here, and bring in the sphere of what you're counting on for other people. Uh, yeah. And then last, we can open it up in a minute here, uh, and I'll take a look at what's coming in on the, um, in the chat as well. Uh, I talked about deep trust last time, which certainly draws on very Buddhist uh, insights. And I offered that there were multiple things even in a world, even in a reality in which most, if not all, phenomena are characterized by impermanence, they're changing, they're dynamic, and characterized by being made of parts that are connected together such that everything exists relationally in a very dynamic kind of way. In that context, what can we really count on? What can we really count on? or count on enough. So that's the category of deep trust. And so hopefully I'll remember, I think there were six things I said. Of course, I had a list um, last time. And first, can you trust? And you can trust. I'll say it differently. You can trust in your own natural goodness. You don't have to be a saint to be a basically decent person who has good intentions, who tries, who makes effort, who is hung in there over time, you can, who has a basic endurance, a basic grittiness that can just survive and live through terrible times. You can trust that in yourself. You can trust that when you're knocked down, maybe you'll hang out there on the floor for a while to catch your breath and like, what happened here? But then gradually you'll get up again and start functioning, start coping and moving forward. Can you trust that in yourself, right? Can you trust that in yourself? You can. Second, you can trust in love. We have to make bets in this life. We can't predict the future perfectly. We're always making a probabilistic call. To use a kind of wild example <laughs> you may have known, if you're facing two doors and behind one door is everything you ever wanted in life, I don't know, all of it. You know, buckets of gold, a wonderful people who adore you, rainbows, unicorns. You know, that's behind door number one. And behind door number two is a hungry tiger who, if you open door number two, will jump out and eat you. And you have to open one of the doors. You have to, you're forced to. So it's, and if you don't open a door, there'll be a coin toss and one of them will be opened. And you know that there's a 51% chance that behind this door, right? The pot, the gold, pots of gold and all the wonderful people. Wonderful. And behind the other door, on the other door is the hungry tiger. You know, and you know there's a 51% chance 
that the gold and the people are behind this door and a 49% chance that behind this door is the tiger. And you have to make a choice where they'll flip a coin and it will be made for you. What's the right choice every time? Every time it's to place your bet on the 51% door, even though, sorry, 49 times out of 100, you're gonna get eaten. And even if you open a door behind which was a tiger and you didn't know which was which, um, even if that happened, uh, you still made the right choice every time. We have to place our bets. Not betting is a bet. I think it was um, Jimmy Chin, the great filmmaker and really serious mountaineer, he made the film uh, Free Solo with uh, Alex Honnold and another amazing film called Meru, M-E-R-U, uh, fantastic film. Um, in any case, Jimmy Chin, I think, said that the greatest risk of all is to not take risks in this life, hopefully appropriate ones. So if we're gonna place a bet, bet on love, bet on love. You can trust love. It won't always turn out exactly, but in your bets in life, what are the bets that involve love in its broadest sense? Compassion, kindness, goodwill, benevolence, uh, respect for justice, uh, cherishing, friendliness, supportiveness. Bet on love and bet on the current of love moving through you. You can trust love and you can trust your bets on love even if sometimes they don't turn out. That's the second thing you can trust. Third thing you can trust is the thisness of the present moment. It is what it is. I mean, it is what it is, right? And this can start to feel kind of very Zen, very Taoist, and very ecstatic as you get closer and closer to the immediacy of the present moment. And it's thisness, it's suchness of the present moment. Uh, it's not anything other than what it is. It's not tricking you. It is what it is, all of, including the aspects that may be ambiguous or complicated or mysterious. Fine, still, the thisness of the present moment is entirely and exactly what it is. And as you get closer and closer to the present moment, it can feel really extraordinary and trusted. And then last, and I'm only remembering four. I think I'll leave it at this one. In my view, oh, actually, I thought of one more thing. You can trust the nature of things. I'm now moving more and more into the deeper end of the pool. In other words, things change, but their nature does not change. You can trust that things are impermanent, most things, if not all things. You can trust that they're made of parts that are connected and arise due to causes and pass away due to causes. In other words, you can trust the nature of things, including a sense of abiding as the nature of things. That might sound kind of weird and abstract, you don't get it at first, but actually we can, there's a kind of shift when you feel like, oh, I am the nature of things. That's my identity. I am impermanent. I am made of parts that are connected and changing and arise interdependently. I am a local rippling in a larger field of reality. Oh, I can trust the nature of things that I am. I can be the nature of things that I am. That's reliable. And if you don't get this, it's really okay. It's, it's like you feel it. And then last, if there is a ground of all, all right, the underlying basis of reality, which the Buddha taught in my view, was ultimately unconditioned as a context or a ground in which conditioned Big Bang universe unfolding occurs, we can trust that ground, the ground of all. And perhaps that ground is also infused with awareness and maybe even a kind of love. And that ground of all, whatever it is, um, is our nature. We are the ground of all, right? And your identity can increasingly start to shift into abiding as that sense of 
unconditioned possibility right at the edge of emergent actuality continuously. And you're kind of living right at that edge of emptiness, somethingness, absence, presence, continuously with immediately there's a feeling of kind of awe and mystery and gratitude to be able to live right there at the hinge of ongoing emergence. You can trust in that because it's the truth of things, isn't it? Okay, so I've kind of previewed and um, I'll see some questions here. Yeah, so let's start with kind of concrete stuff. Does someone have a question who'd like to talk with me here um, specifically about helping yourself realize that you can expand the field of trust in a key relationship today, grounded in um, uh, really appreciating in a new way maybe how trustworthy you actually are and what you can trust in yourself. Anybody? And I'll, in other words, yeah. No? Anybody want to raise their hand? There's a reactions button at the bottom here. And I see Bob and Doris. Great. Is that Doris in Hawaii, I think? And um, if you push that reactions button and raise your hand, bingo. Great. All right. Good. So it's, got a couple people right here. All right. Here we go. Doris and Bob, I'm asking you to unmute. As usual, a focus question related to what we're talking about of general interest. Great. Doris. Okay, great. Aloha. Aloha. So, um, we just got married uh, 2019 Christmas Eve morning, but uh, we had met each other when we were 17 and 20, but, you know, had different lives and then came together. Ah. And I thought I was getting this perfect guy. I got married, you know, 12, 12 years. I prayed for the perfect guy and he really is, but he Good. had... Uh, from childhood, and I do too. I'm the youngest of 10. He's the seventh of nine. And we just realized about two weeks ago that he doesn't trust people because he, he doesn't have friends. And then I realized I'm having a hard time trusting him because he had cheated on his wife. And I thought that I could get over that. He was single when I met him again, you know, two years ago. But it's really a hard trust thing. So this is a perfect, you know, mm. what suggestions would you have for us? And oh, we're yeah. and into this, we want to grow old together. So we're, we're doing all your stuff and we're reading the books and all that. So this is our, this is like our topic. Oh, that's awesome. And I totally appreciate you, including uh, the victim in the corner. I, I mean, your husband over there. <laughs> You know, who's being outed here. So good stuff all the way around. All right, great. Um, so Doris, I'm sure you've done this. Uh, you have you must have had the experience and other people as well where you're walking along and the ground is, you know, it's muddy. It's, or you can't quite see. Maybe it's at dusk, uh, dark, perhaps you're, and you're feeling your way, right? It's like that. We can feel our way into, let's say in one case, a potential friend. And we can feel our way. And as long as it feels okay, we keep going. On the other hand, if we bump into uh, something that's wrong, you can feel like there's a big hole in the path that's, you know, you did that uh, you're gonna fall into, you, you back away from it. Look, for example, you potentially hang out with someone, you have a casual lunch with them, it doesn't have to be a big deal. And you walk away from that thinking, you know, I felt like I kept having to prove myself or impress that person. It just didn't feel right. They never listened to me. You know, they just talked forever, yakety yak, never asked me a personal question, interrupted me when I started talking. Eh, there's like a big pit there. I'm not gonna, that's, I'm not gonna go down that path again. But you can know that you're going to be, you know, trust but verify, right? You're going to be verifying along the way. That is the fundamental process, really. And it's helpful to do it in very simple steps, especially if you have a background in which there was a lack of trustworthy support for you. This is what I've done. This is what others have done. This is a model, you know. And then what happens as you do take those steps, it's really important, 
is to internalize it when it goes well. <clears throat> because remember, you're trying to move back the bars of your cage. You're trying to expand the field in which um, you can open out and connect, right? You could still be yourself, an introverted, private person, analytic maybe, liking solitude, it's fine, right? But you're expanding the field in which you can relate to others. Similarly, in a relationship, including if there's some kind of personal history, I mean, there are things we do that are like walking on a trail, that, but they're not tangible with other people. We look in their eyes and we try to discern, do you really get it? That whatever led you to do that thing in the past, I have, you know, just about everybody has different things they've done that you look back on with remorse. I certainly do, you know? And then when you, you can look in that person's eyes and ask yourself, hey, do you really, do you really get what led you to do that? And are you on the other side of that? So that the odds, remember we always place bets, we can't not place bets. The odds are extremely low that you'll ever do it again. You know, do I, do I feel that? Do I feel that? And here it is ultimately um, with other people, we cannot perfectly control the future. On the one hand, darn, but on the other hand, imagine if you could perfectly control the future, well, that would mean other people could perfectly control the future too, which would reduce your control over the future and it would be tyranny, potentially. So we can love people and we can't guarantee that they will be alive in a year. Wow, that's heavy duty, isn't it? I mean, if you have kids, for example, I've had to face this with my family. You know, they they drive they pull out they drive away. They're going somewhere. I don't know if they will make it back alive. I think they will. The odds are very high. I live in a pretty safe area, but you just don't know. So are we still prepared to love and make that investment when we don't know exactly? Uh or illness. Will illness take someone as we age? Uh will illness take someone else? And still we give our heart to them because we're brave enough to do that. And we know that love feeds us and heals us as it flows through us, right? And we know that if we're uh, emotionally invested in someone, it's conceivably possible that they'll betray us. Something might, it's conceivable. It might be extraordinarily unlikely. Or, you know, you can be utterly sure, but, at the end of the day, if the odds are really low and you have confidence in yourself, would you rather love and lose? Would you rather love and risk losing? Would you rather love and risk being betrayed than never love at all? And as we get older, frankly, man, if you find a keeper, hold on. <laughs> Because the pickings get slimmer, <laughs> you know, as you age. Where'd you go, Doris? You're somewhere. I can't see you in the screens, but hopefully that was helpful. Is that okay? That's good. I think you've muted yourself. Okay, great. So I see my friend Max here and Maureen. Uh, Michael, I may get to you. I'm going to try to, but okay, Max and Maureen asking you to unmute. Howdy ho. Great. Hey there. Good to see you again. Yeah, exactly. Um, thanks for the talk tonight. What I was reflecting on is that it's hard for me to trust myself because I feel like I want to control outcomes. It's really hard for me to let go. I had a narcissistic mother and a alcoholic father who weren't really trusting pillars of hope. And so my negatively biased mind tends to sometimes get the worst of me in certain circumstances. So. I guess I'm looking for some inspiration and thoughts along those lines. Um, it, great question. One thing is to know what it's like to have trust or confidence in ourselves. And I can think of it in a simple way as appraising. So, you know, what are the odds that as you drive down the street in your nice van, 
that you will drive successfully. You will stop at the red lights. You know, you will make it to the grocery store and back again. You know what that's like to uh, appraise a potential future with a high degree of confidence that it will turn out. It sounds kind of rational, but that is the nature of trust. We're making appraisals, and then on the basis of our appraisals, we're placing bets. We do that all the time. Monkeys in the wild do that. The blue jays and uh, doves in our backyard make those bets themselves. Can I afford to come down out of the tree and peck at the food on the ground without being attacked by some predator? Okay, so... And then in so doing, you know what it's like to be confident in yourself in one area, like um, driving a van, let's say, or operating a business. Know what that feels like where you're on solid ground. Know what that feels like. And then imagine bringing that sense of resourcefulness, of a ruggedness, a knowing your own sincerity. Like if you think of yourself, Max, as someone I know and like, you have just tremendous natural sincerity. You can trust in your sincerity. You trust in your good heartedness, your, your willingness to see clearly, willingness to repair. You know, know what it feels like to have confidence in those qualities. And then whoop, imagine whoop, applying them into a relationship, including maybe a relationship that seems particularly challenging, like with the kind of people that were not trustworthy when you were young, maybe authority figures or you know, people who feel kind of big for their britches, they're sort of narcissistic, they take up a lot of space. Can you still trust yourself uh, to function and be successful uh, with them? Um, do you see what I'm talking? You know, you kind of stabilize, they're like rock climbing, we're sure rock climbers, you know, you stabilize here and then you bring that, you know, there. What do you think about that? Yeah, that that's that fits. It feels like if I'm able to fall back on my inner resource of I'm okay no matter what. I'm, I'm inherently a good person. I have a lot to offer, and kind of shoring up those inner senses of who I am, like you were talking about. Thank you for giving me all those compliments. Um, factual. <laughs> Well, I could say a bunch of really nice compliments back at you that would be actual too, Rick, but we're not here for that. But you always do say really, you know, just such kind and wise things that I respect a lot. And that's the truth. So um, I think that it's, it's, you know, doing that over time seems to help me the more during my day when I get caught in some kind of situation where I'm afraid of the outcome, I want to control it because I don't trust that it's going to be a good ending. You know, when I catch those moments, that feels like a moment of awakening, like you talked about um, or you've spoken about plenty of times. And that's a time that I can go, oh, wait, I have resources. I have a track record. And, you know, the odds are going to be okay right here. I'm doing, I've done the groundwork. To yeah, that's have, right. Yeah, to have a good outcome. And then be willing, what, what uh, creates the boundaries of our invisible cage? It's the experiences we dread. If we're willing to tolerate what might happen, if you place the right bet, but then you hit that one in 10 chance that the other person's really a schmuck, okay? Could you tolerate what you might experience as a result? Yeah, probably. Uh, and knowing that you could tolerate the dreaded experience really helps us to become more willing. Like again, tolerating a leader fall. Now, if you take a leader fall and pull your pro and break your hand, you know, that's, that's something <laughs> you know, we try to avoid in the future. <laughs> but in general, if you trust a willingness to take a fall, well, then you can keep climbing in much the same way. If you trust that you could handle feeling hurt or angry or betrayed, You'd get through it after a few hours or days. You know, you'd move mainly to the other side. If there's a willing, if you could, if you can trust that you could handle that dreaded experience, well, then you can take more chances in this life, wise chances. Yeah, thank you. That that fits well, and I think it's just uh, believing and then keeping that inner resource of positivity growing. Yeah, and knowing that no matter what, I'm going to be okay. 
And I've been through these types of experiences before, as we all have as adults. We've had yeah. you know that for that 49% of the tiger jumping out. You're like, yep, it's gonna happen here and there. And you know, I think for me it's like, how do I how do I let that be part of the process? Whether you're smiling through it, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um this is great, and I'm seeing comments come in in the chat that are very relevant, and I'll, I'll speak briefly, and then I'll definitely get to you, Michael. I can see that we're okay here. Good. Um, well, let's see. So uh, a person, let's say, who has very little self-trust, which is very understandable, just look for where you actually can count on yourself. Can you count on yourself to brush your teeth every day? Can you count on yourself to flush the toilet after you use it? Can you count on yourself to um, have generally good intentions with other people? Can you count on yourself? Know what it's like to count on yourself for that. Can you, can you lift the bottle or glass successfully without pouring the water all over the floor? You can count on that. Know what that's like. Know what it's like in these simple ways and then start building out from there. And um, be, be aware if you can of habitual mist trust of oneself, habitual self-doubt. Habitual self-doubt that corrodes an appropriate trust in ourself uh, sometimes has is there for the function of preventing dreaded experiences. Because you know, if, if you totally mistrust yourself, you'll never take a chance that might end up hurting you. So you start out by totally mistrusting yourself and therefore you live inside a pretty small cage. You live pretty small, but you know, it prevents dreaded experiences. Well, recognizing that in yourself and helping yourself appreciate that you can um, actually tolerate the painful experiences you might encounter if you trusted yourself and it just didn't go well, then you're more prepared to take those chances. Take wise chances. Right, and you know, bet, try to increase the odds, max the odds, maximize the odds that it'll be a successful bet if you can. Pick people who are trustworthy to open your heart to. Um, open your heart a little bit and see what they do, and then if it goes well, open a little further. Maybe you know, set yourself to self up to succeed at this. This is the progressive process that I see really works. You take a step, and if it goes well, and it usually does. If it goes badly, help yourself tolerate that experience. And if it goes well, really internalize that experience. So then you can take the next step, building out as you go. Really progressive. Um, I think I'll leave it there, Max, you know, and, um, oh, I wanna say one more thing kind of briefly, which is that also it depends on how sticky life is. How much are we like Velcro? as life glides on by. And the more that we can be Velcro, I mean, te Teflon-ish with other people, not that we're cold and distant, but that we just don't feel so implicated by or invaded by their reactivity. If we have more of that sense of a kind of fluidity in our interactions with others, then we don't need to fear so much the dreaded experiences we might have if they were cranky or critical or uninterested in us. It's like more and more you have a sense of I'm doing me. You do you, I'm doing me, I'm doing this, this person process over here, this particular wave in the whole sea of the ocean. This, this wave's going on. We're cooking, we're okay, we're doing our thing. And I hope you'll hang out with me you know, I hope you'll be good to me. But if you're not, my wave is unfolding. Not out of conceit or arrogance or privilege or superiority, but just out of a kind of discernment and an equanimity that increasingly, you know, doesn't feel so implicated by. We can have compassion for the mind streams of others without feeling implicated in them. Okay. So, Michael, yeah, asking you to unmute, and then I'll finish with you. Oops. Hey, Rick. Yeah, Mike Gafka. Nice to, uh, nice to see you. Yeah. Um, my question on trust is, how do you navigate a lifetime of 
trying to deal with like a narcissistic parent who was, you know, pretty overbearing while also trying to get your own needs met where, you know, the people and the world that the way you relate to the world is a much softer and kinder way. But this person that's always between you and the world is much, much more narcissistic and harsher. And you always have to keep paying the bill in order to maintain something. And then even when you do all that, they can pull the rug out anytime they want. And they're willing to take the pain for whatever, you know, kind of agenda they have, and they will dig in forever, if that's what it takes. Yeah. How do you how do you decide when to cut loose? How do you decide yeah. how much you're going to change? Yeah. If you do, how do you make these decisions? How do you trust in a way where you don't really know what the outcome is going to be? Yep. Yeah, it's right on. It's real. And let me add that we record these talks and discussions, uh, and then we post them typically by Saturday morning. Uh, and so if, if you have any interest in this, and also if you want to save the chat, uh, if anybody does, you go down to your own little uh, message bar, message place at the bottom of the chat sidebar. There are three horizontal dots. You click on them, you can save the chat, and it'll get saved somewhere on your computer. So yeah, I'm saying that to people in general. So Michael, yeah, uh, kind of briefly, one is to see clearly. There's no replacement for discernment. And to use, go back to my metaphor with Doris and, and Bob, um, on the shaky, muddy, clouded, dark-nighted path, we want to feel our way and recognize, is there a good path here or, I'm on the, or am I on the edge of a pit or a cliff? Okay, so we want to see clearly. Me, I'm kind of like, if somebody does something once that's weird, like what? You know, it even could be kind of a small one, but like, what? My eyebrows go up and I start paying more attention. If I see him do it again, the odds are pretty good that that's a tendency that they have. Or, and then third, three times, huh, I got it. And then, so you, you see them and then you try to repair. You, so you initiate some kind of repair influence. You double check your understanding. You try to see if they're willing to budge or switch. You know, you're trying to see if they can even tolerate a repair conversation if you initiate it. And if you recognize three times, let's say, and it's not in a hard and fast Rick rule, don't make it a Rick rule, but if more or less, you know, what's the Maya Angelou line when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. I'm saying, you know, give them a chance, believe them by the third time, and then see if you can repair. And if you see that they're a certain way, three times or more, I suspect in your case with a parent, it'd be like 3,000 and three. Yeah, times. I was going to say it's three followed by four zeros. Yeah. And then they won't repair. At that point, it just tells you for me. And then you're in a moral question about what's your duty to this aging parent and your duty to yourself. But if you see them as what they are, then. But it's so, you know, in this case, uh, my mom passed away a year ago. And uh, as, as a effort to try to overlook our differences and to try to contribute when he needed help you know i kind of over invested myself only at the end for him to go hey yeah i'll just hypothetically say i'm not giving you anything it's all going to your brother well people can be horrible and yeah and then i think also in you know again finishing up here and obviously a lot of specifics that, that are important. You know, I've had parents who aged and eventually passed away. I've had siblings with whom there were complications. And, uh, you know, these are kind of fraught things. I'll just maybe close on a personal view, okay? Apart from whatever might feel like a compelling duty to, that involves putting up with a load of crap to fulfill that duty to maybe a dementing parent or a frail parent, whatever feels like a moral duty or whatever seems to you like something you've just got to put up with, 
to end up with an inheritance that you deserve. Other than maybe those two things, maybe there might be something else that's a really big stake on the table that I haven't named. But other than those two clear things, the rest of it, I got to ask, duty to self compared to duty to others. And if you've been messed with and let down, uh, my view, parents have a profound duty to their children uh, to really take good care of them because they're inflicting consciousness on this vulnerable kid. Um, I think it's important that kids don't just write their parents out of their life unless there's some extremely good reason to do so. That's the nuclear option, obviously. Better understand it if you're going to use it. But otherwise, you know, you've got a parent who was kind of a jerk when you were a kid and has become even more of a jerk as they age, despite your best efforts. Uh, at some point, you just, with sorrow, maybe take a really big step back. And you could apply this, of course, to other people as well. Uh, you see clearly, and at a certain point, then you take a big step back and you kind of observe what's your own psychology that keeps you maybe entangled with a person or maybe in a sweet, hopeful way, keeps drawing you back in, like Charlie Brown and Lucy, to kick the football, yet, try to kick the football yet again, even though she yanks it away every time. Okay, what do you think as we finish up here? Yeah, no, I think easier said than done. <laughs> and and you're, you, you have to, your machinery has to be working properly in order to do these things. And when you get hit with the shock, which in yeah. this case is a huge one, you know, you, you can't do everything in tandem. You, you literally have to reestablish that homeostasis. And then from there, you can say, okay, now I'm evaluating things clearly again. You know, so it takes time to do all that. Oh, yeah, totally. And as we finish, I think it's a kind of a question, which is how much do you matter to you? That's a question for everyone. How much do you matter to you. And it doesn't mean um, becoming arrogant or narcissistic or sociopathic. It just means, wow, how much do you matter to you? And if you really do matter to you, what would it be like to treat yourself like you really matter in the real world of tangled, messy financial, I mean, uh, family relationships, which may well involve money? Um, and Second, can you clarify for yourself where your boundaries lie and what is the offering you will be making? What is the your version of what I call unilateral virtue, your own personal code of conduct? Be clear about that. You will do X, but you will not do Y. And you're willing to uh, take the risks of that, including in terms of potentially an inheritance. I'm not telling you what to do. It's more like I'm suggesting you clarify for yourself what you're going to tell yourself to do. What What is your clear offering? And then be at peace. One of the things you know I've kind of learned in my life is that I can love other people, but I can't make them love me. You know, I can act with um, decency and virtue. I can't make them do that. And I can distance from people as best I can that are dangerous in various ways, including emotionally dangerous. Yes, uh, very much so. Okay. Yep. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Very much.